Welcome to the Shack 15 Conversations podcast, where we invite founders, innovators, and changemakers to share ideas with the community, speak to the experience of building their businesses, and unlock some of the hard-earned wisdom collected along the way. In this episode, we'll join our moderator, Marcus Colombano, founder of creative studio Pineapple, as he invites the New York Times best-selling author, Ian Urbina and the renowned ambient soundscape artist Christopher Willits to explore the nexus between journalistic pursuit and musical exploration. Ian is the author of the best-selling book Outlaw Ocean, which chronicles five years spent at sea among pirates in international waters. And Christopher is the artist behind The Unknown Sea, a first-of-its-kind EP written to accompany the narrative of the book. The result, a dual masterpiece and fascinating collaboration between the creative and analytical brains, all in support of an important cause. Enjoy. I'm really excited about this conversation. I've been looking forward to it, and I'm so glad to collaborate uh, with you, Christopher, um, on making this conversation happen. And I think it would be great if both of you were to kind of just give everybody a little bit of a background of uh, who you are and, and, and what you do. And then we can kind of get into how this all came together. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for, for having us, you guys. And uh, I guess the project is working. I mean, you know, Marcus, this is exactly the intention behind the project is to get more people understanding the issues behind the ocean and you know, start to use music and journalism uh, together as a way to, you know, create emotionally these opportunities to start to engage with one another. Yeah, so I'm a musician. I'm an artist. Uh, I really believe that music is the most incredible thing. I believe that it speaks to feelings and emotions that are difficult to say in words sometimes, at least for myself. And so at a young age, I started to just play so much guitar and uh, was born in Kansas City and then moved out to San Francisco, studied at Mills College. And I've been out here ever since just creating all the music that I love. And, you know, with always the intention of, of an empathy and uh, a deep compassion for the listening experience. I think the music is just the most incredible thing to, to share with one another. And, you know, personally, there's so much enjoyment and catharsis that comes through the creative process and to be able to share music with other people and listen together, I think really, really uh, epitomizes what it means to be human and to connect with one another here on this planet. And so to work on this project with Ian and, and really connect that and align the music to the oceans, which really need our help right now, is just been incredible. So my name is Ian uh, Urbina. I'm a journalist. I've been for 20 years at the New York Times and then uh, a year ago left and began just uh, producing stories on my own. Um, the last six years have been spent uh, on a series called The Outlaw Ocean that was this um, and is this sort of global exploration of lawlessness at sea and sort of the two thirds of the planet that is water and the 56 million people that work out there and, you know, that that sort of organism, if you will, of the oceans um, that provide us with 50% of the air we breathe, you know, is this relatively invisible, forgotten space that most people think of as a realm that you travel across or sun on the edge of. But um, I wanted to sort of uh, journalistically, anthropologically, if you will, go out there and chronicle all that's happening, good and bad. Um, so that's the sort of spirit or motivation of the journalism that culminated in the book and more relevant to the discussion today is I had this crazy uh, dream really, you know, as a avid lifelong consumer and admirer of music and musicians, um, I had this thought that maybe I could use this body of reporting as a ticket to access people like Christopher if I could convince them to sort of join me on this harebrained experiment where, you know, if we view ourselves as two different types of storytellers, Chris is for using one language and me using another, um, what if we tried to make stories out of this reporting, but in his language? And, um, you know, I just, uh, I only knew 
Christopher as a fan and as a Spotify admiree, you know, and um, so I just uh, reached out to him and and said, well, you know, why should movies be the only thing with soundtracks? Why can't a book have a soundtrack? And would you consider using um, this book to sort of create a song um, at minimum and um, sort of use that as an alternate way to get at people and to maybe even bring this reporting to a new demographic of people? And off we went, and here we are. I think that you guys have such a, an amazing kind of parallel process. I think, you know, as Christopher was saying, there's this, he, he basically wants to communicate without words. It's like his, his kind of inner vision and spirit and things that he's experienced in his life. And I, I think that if you listen to his tracks, you can listen to individual tracks of his and their, their stories, their experiences, and you listen to an entire album and the piece is highly immersive and you feel like you've just experienced like this amazing kind of emotional trip um and then even you know christopher your enveloped technology you've even gone deeper where you really tried to spend the time to give people an even deeper experience get them to go deeper into themselves go deeper into the music and surround themselves uh with it ian you are a journalist and you want to take individuals with you to experience what you've experienced and tell them a story and get them to feel the same way that you feel, have their own opinions, but you present the facts like they were there. And I think what's interesting about the book is that it's not just one facet of the outlaw ocean. It's, it's like the outlaw planet and you're, visit, you're, you're an alien who's visiting the outlaw planet and you realize that there, there's this tribe and this tribe and this tribe and they're doing this and that and this and that and it all combines into this entire environment and culture and society that's multifaceted. And so I think there's an interesting parallel between the journeys that both of you take your readers or listeners on. And I'd love you guys to kind of both talk about that and, and did that come up in the collaboration process at all? Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible how, how it came about, you know, speaking towards the synchronicities that we've all kind of alluded to, whether it's dreams or, or late night connections. You know, I was just devouring these articles that were published on the New York Times. And a friend of mine had actually posted some of them on Twitter. And so I was just so into this. And so I was reading a bunch of them. And like a week later, Ian just messaged me, you know, send me an email out of the blue. It's like, wow, this is incredible, you know, because while I was reading that, I was just hearing all this music. And so that that was just, yeah, an incredible synchronicity that all, all came about. But yeah, I, I think there's a really great, you know, connection and, and synthesis with music and with with literature, with, with writing, and in this case, investigative journalism. It's... Um, I personally love music without words. I think that music is a universal language, so I kind of like to keep it that way. <laughs> and, you know, anyone can enjoy it. But to tether it to just an incredible body of work, you know, these, these just brilliantly written and impassioned vignettes that are full of courage and, and so much real, like, neutrality at the same time. It just really was speaking my language. And um, after the introduction that, that Ian made, we were really just off to the races. I, I feel like there is a lot of just clarity in our mutual intentions and, and really grateful that Ian trusted me into the project and yeah, allowed me to, to create through it. One of the hopes I had was that, um, as Christopher said, there's something 
even the best writer struggles to truly capture a reader, right? And I have the luxury of time and to really work on my stories. And, but language is limiting, it's rational, and there are space limitations and your ability to access people viscerally and emotionally is limited. And the thing that I, you know, just a quick digression. So I used to play, and I still do, this game called the Imagination Game. I, um, with my 16 year old son where when we were driving and he was 10, 11, I'd have them in the back of the car, my son and his friends. And I would put on instrumental music, usually something dramatic, you know, often soundtrack type music. And I'd play it up to the break, you know, the first 15 seconds. And then I'd turn the uh, sound off and I'd give each of the kids in the back seat 15 seconds to figure out in their own head, in their own imagination, what was happening in that scene in their own head based on that music. And it was like reverse engineering. There's a writing exercise without the writing, right? Like they were reverse engineering emotions and imagery and narrative from the music in their own, with their own clay, right? And we played this game and it was really fun and very left brainy. And, and in some ways this project was a version of that in that I kind of wanted to go to Chris and reverse it again and say like, okay, I've got this, opus you know choose what moves you what scene what character what chapter what topic moves you and then translate it back into pure raw emotion without words kind of feeling and create out of that and let's put them together in a lightly tethered way there'll be titling that connects them there'll be imagery that connects them but at the end of the day it's music first concept second and i want people to feel the music and if they're moved by it then they'll be curious to to figure out What's this connected to? What's it about? Just like you did, Marcus. And then they'll start digging into the journalism, but very gently, you know, not like didactic, pulling them by the, and that was the goal. And it worked, you know, like strangely, bizarrely enough, it really worked because Christopher got it and he made music that really grabbed people on its own accord. And then he allowed me to sort of ride his coattails. Interesting that you, I mean, you should bring that up. And I think that there's, there's, a, there's a nugget in there that is a running theme in the book. And I think it's a running theme in your philosophy about engaging with people, which is kind of silence and quiet and letting people approach you or come up with ideas from this like absence of, of sound and engagement because that what comes from them is authentic when it comes from them on their own terms. And you, if you read through the book, there's, there's this ever running theme of silence and open space and the, you know, the sea is vast just inherently. But I think that there's a level of respect that you had with the people that you talked to and wrote about that you let them come to you on their terms and talk to you about their lives. And I think it's really interesting to hear the interaction between you and your kids, this kind of, here's an idea, here's a space, silence, you think about it. What, what does this mean for you? The same thing with, with Christopher, which is, here's the book, take from it what you will and come back to me with your thoughts. And I think that, you know, that, that is in of itself is a highly respectful process. We talked about collaboration and how not meddling in another person's medium is the best way Mm -hmm. to collaborate what, yeah. what do you guys think about that no, i mean i think i mean there was a certain risk and fear in taking six years of your life and taking some stuff that can be really dark and politically charged and and handing it to someone that you don't know and saying could you do a respectful rendering of this that doesn't trivialize it and doesn't make us both look dumb by commercializing suffering you know like there are real risks here what's funny is and this is true in journalism you can size people up pretty quickly and um <laughs> one conversation with christopher i could tell like this guy is not going to go all you know like he gets it and he understands the parameters and i don't need to worry and so i just hand it over and then if he wants and you know with other artists as well like if, if they want to take it in a very explicit direction, so be it. If they want to take it in a very interpretive direction and give it real breathing room and have it be purely emotional, but not like have words. I do think you're right. There's trust um, and silence and space that you have to afford uh, in this collaboration. And, and I think that's what gave him so much room to come out with uh, an amazing song. 
So, I mean, I think to, to mention here um, is that there are a number of artists on this album and they're all, they're all very, very different. And I think what's interesting is they all very much kind of like hit upon different types of themes and moods and, and parts of the book because the book isn't just emptiness and silence. It's, there's high, you know, there's adventure and there is, you know, criminality and there is, as you said, darkness and there is, there are heroes and joy all throughout this book. But what I think what's interesting, and the, the theme I glommed, glommed onto immediately was this theme of silence. And Christopher, the way that you talk about writing your music feels like you start with this theme of like, I'm going to empty my head and it comes to me. I mean, that's the way I feel when I listen to your music is that it comes, it, there's a genesis and it's an environment and it, it, it fills you and it, I don't know if it, it does that with you. It's like, I'm going to write it and you are filled with the music, but that's the way it comes out. Yeah, it, it's definitely like that. There's, there's a, a, this creative process that's quite mysterious where the music, it's coming through me. And at the same time, there's a, a consciousness of the space that that music is creating for other people to enter into and, you know, creating that listening experience. So yeah, that the trust that, that Ian is talking about, I think is really critical. You know, the the synchronicity of the way that everything emerged was was nearly enough trust for me to just dive in. And then getting into the book was just it was like another world. It's just truly an incredible piece of work. I can't wait to read it again. I mean it's really that good so many details so many stories within stories and um and it's very musical the way that it's it's broken into these these vignettes these chapters and it reminds me similar to like pieces of a movement or different tracks on an album in a way so you know the the flow of the music really for me it did like marcus what you're saying it it has to start from that blank canvas it has to start from a neutrality and instead of thinking of this is what I have to make or this is what I should be making you know you relieve all that judgment so you can just really square up to the moment the present moment of creating and it's a fascinating process and in this case it was really really cathartic I knew that I was feeling so much I was feeling a combination of inspiration knowing that someone had risked their life and zigzagged across the high seas to cultivate all this information for us. A lot of information that hasn't been compiled in one place together, especially from all these different angles of what's going on on the high seas. And, uh, you know, that inspiration was all also teamed with the sadness and a helplessness in a way of just like, wow, like, what have we done? what is going on and, and how am I a part of that? Because I'm participating in all of this just like everyone else, you know? And so there's, a, there's really a heartbreak in that, but uh, there's also a healing and an understanding and a presence of that emotion. So that's really where the music started to come through. And on, you know, so on the personal level, it started to emerge. And then as it started to also grow and I started to get into kind of the technical details of the mix and things, I kept imagining if this was a movie, what would the music be like? You know, and that, that really helped to kind of bring, you know, kind of shape and sculpt that raw emotion that was in trans the vibration into kind of a narrative journey with a beginning and a middle and an ending, roughly speaking. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just want to keep doing this. I mean, in the past, I've created a lot of music that's been inspired by things that I've, I've read, but nothing's been such a literal collaboration and kind of a transformation of that word into the vibration of music. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to explore this a lot more. Marcus, I and mean, there's one thing that Chris said that, you know, when I first approached Christopher and I was trying to convey the idea, on the one hand, I, I wanted to convey that it was open and there was a lot of room, but I also had to 
sort of define it to some degree and give it clarity and parameters or else it was just this random you know nebulous thought and so um i kept referring to it as a soundtrack for a book and but i kept worrying that if that was taken too literally the musician might in Chris, christopher's case might think okay well he has a specific vision a specific scene and he wants me to score that scene and so i i kept having to fold back and say okay, this book in a weird way, and unlike anything I've ever reported on in the last 20 years, is truly a world unto itself that has heroism and horror, it has openness and confinement, it has slavery and it has liberation. It's got kind of everything you might want. So you can go whatever way you want um, with it, uh, depending on what grabs you most viscerally. But I do want you to engage with the material. And I'm not saying read the whole thing. It's a long book. But pick <laughs> what you want, grab that, dive into it, and then translate. That's all I'm asking. I like what you make. So use that lens that is your talent and translate it through that lens into those products. And, you know, I, I didn't even know whether that would make sense to musicians. And it has. You know, it immediately, he immediately got it and said, okay, great. Leave it to me, you know, like, and, and the beautiful thing as a writer, like, is you, Marcus and Chris, are you like actually read the book? Like you, you, <laughs> you know, it's a long book and it's a real scary thing um, to ask someone to plow through it all. And then when you talk with them three months later and they can actually mention specific scenes and characters, you're like, wow, this person really put in the time and got to know the characters and the issues. And so for me, it's been a beautiful experience for all those reasons. Well, I mean, you, reading the book, you know the amount of effort that you put in, risking your life to make this work. And all we can do is respect that and give you the time back to read it because it's definitely worth that time. Um, so thank you. It's, I mean, I, uh, it's a, an amazing, amazing book. I mean, you bring up a really good point, which is like, you know, is it is the music inspired in general by the book itself, or is there are there specific vignettes that inspire the music? And I think that there's some of the there's some of the uh, tracks on the album that feel more specifically inspired, and some that feel more generally inspired. Christopher, is there something that comes to mind? that hit you after reading the book that inspired you to write the music the way you did? It was a feeling of the blues, honestly. It's a feeling of heartbreak, but also knowing that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that there's got to be a silver lining. And that's really what fueled the music. Um, a love for the oceans uh, and a trust and an inspiration, knowing that an international community can understand this information and we can make policies that can change the course that we're currently on. We were faced with such big problems. I just read an article today, I don't even remember where it was from, which was all the big stories that aren't getting any of the attention with COVID, the COVID crisis. And I think that there's so much that goes on on land every day that it's hard to keep track of what's happening in the ocean. Um, and I think, Ian, you've done such an incredible job of bringing the, what's going on on planet ocean so front and center. And it's a primer course, primer course on things to be aware of that, as you said, Christopher, we all play a part in. I mean, I feel like the people, the people that you describe, Ian, in your book feel like pawns with these power brokers on land uh, controlling the strings. And that although they're villains and there are victims, all of them feel like they're in some way being controlled by people um, with money and power and that a lot of what they decide to do is just based on survival and a desire to to survive. Yeah, I mean, you, you said a couple of things that really resonate. I mean, one, as a lifelong, you know, newspaper guy, you know, I spent my whole life doing this. Um, there's always this struggle in journalism with the sort of 15 year olds playing soccer where everyone runs at the ball. And um, 
and editors, I think, suffer from that um, sort of problem uh, in a competitive fashion. And so the desire on the part of a reporter to not run at that one ball and instead cut the other direction and l look for the stories that no one's tackling um, has been a growing challenge, first with the internet and then with the Trump administration and then with COVID. You know, like these are like forces of gravity from a news perspective and not for illegitimate reasons, you know, but they're nonetheless forces of gravity that pull all the attention to a very narrow center and hugely important things are left um, uncovered and that has life and death consequences. So the, the Owl Ocean was like a, a real uh, extreme version of running away from the ball, you know? Like, um, <laughs> And then secondly, I just say like, this somewhat digresses, you know, it's Christopher's is one album. It's not one album, it's, it's a whole, pro the project consists of multiple albums from different genres and artists from different countries and um, it gets back to the journalism issue in the sense that there are two things that we're experimenting with here, thanks to Christopher. One is trying to figure out how you make this kind of journalism financially viable. If a story like, if, if one of the stories in the, in the series, you know, a typical story costs ninety, dollars $100,000 and a magazine might pay $10,000 for it, you've got a ninety, dollars $80,000 gap there as to how you're gonna pay for that reporting. And by teaming up with uh, you know, musicians and trying to build a model in which the very streaming of the music that's connected to the journalism helps support more of the journalism. There's like you know, this new thing that we're trying here with the Outlaw Ocean Music Project. And, and that has been one of the really inspiring, gen generous ways in which musicians have helped me and this craft, you know, like stay alive and this kind of journalism. And it's also a distribution play in that, like I mentioned my son before, you know, I think there are a lot of young people from my son's age, he's 16 up to 30, who consume a lot of information and, and a lot of news, but they get it not from the New York Times or the New Yorker or wherever, the LA Times, but they get it from YouTube and music videos and comedy and other means of culture and like, the thought here was, why don't we go to them where they are and bring the news to them? And so what if we commandeered Spotify and Pandora and turned them into news outlets? And what if we got the likes of Christopher to make an amazing song that gets us into the music club, but then Spotify gives us a, a space on their platform to host videos about the stories behind that music. Now all of a sudden we're talking to my son, you know, like we're bringing the news to him in a space where he's consuming information. So that's the other. I'm not. I'm not 15, and that's the exact path that it went for me. <laughs> it went from a text message with a share link to Spotify, to about the song, to the book, right? right. Um, and it works. And, and we don't. I think we don't take our information in silos as much anymore. Yeah. Um, it's all part of. I heard that song as part of a movie or that song was part of a video that I watched that was about a video game that I play. But now I follow the artist that, you know, scored the video game. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, so I think that I mean, it's amazing because I think it's not necessarily co-opting, it's, it's the way we consume now. Yeah, but, but from my perspective, it took a lot of generosity from the likes of Christopher because, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, I wanted access to his people, you know, his audience, his world, his platforms. And I wanted to bring this journalism in there if I could. And so, you know, really, if he had said, no, thanks, you know, then, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do this. But musicians like Christopher and Christopher in particular were willing to sort of let me into the club, allow me a side door into this realm through the music. And now people are aware of the reporting thanks to the music. Well, I think what's interesting about that, and Christopher, you talked about it, is that there's a genuineness and authenticity and a deep respect for the work that you have done in telling the story. And when you run into somebody like Christopher who wants to communicate feelings and emotions through music, and your book is so full of that, the, the idea that he would have an opportunity to... Um, to build on top of that, it's just, it's almost a given. It's kind of like how many people get uh, confronted with an opportunity to do that? 
if you were just doing it to do as a promotion, uh, I don't think that that would necessarily have been as attractive. Yeah, I hope. I hope that maybe Christopher was just bored and generous. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I think it's I think it's great. That's actually one of the aspects of the project I was really attracted <laughs> to. Musicians and artists, uh, or sorry, musicians and writers, were all in a similar boat where it's very difficult to generate income to support what we love to do. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, through this kind of like hack, so to speak, you know, Ian's hacking Spotify. <laughs> and uh, through that, perhaps there's other types of engagement that can start to emerge, whether that's music that can play along with like an audible book or something of this sort, you know, there's just, there's a really great opportunity to bring sound in terms of the spoken word and also music that's uh, aligned intentionally in its storytelling and the outcomes that it's wishing to drive. I think there's some really cool things that could happen here. So, yeah. I don't know if I mean, this is true anymore, but I mean, this idea of using other mediums to, not for their intended purpose, is not unknown. I mean, for a really long time, and it still might be the case, that YouTube was actually the most popular music listening service on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was because people were actually, instead of uploading videos, were uploading complete songs and albums to YouTube for people to listen to. Um, so much so now that YouTube has now become a music service and now there's YouTube music. But I think that there is a history of people co-opting channels and, and ways of doing things for their own uh, purposes and people glom onto that. And um, that's how new things are discovered. It's, it's also, I mean, um, you know, uh, Spotify and Pandora and Apple Play and Google Play and all these folks like have now with this project started to realize their own self-interest in, in, in that those guys have a lot of X, which is music, but they don't have a lot of other stuff and they need to grow. And so they're looking to expand into the video market, into the game market, into um, sort of just visual realms because they have the audience and they need to keep expanding on them. And so the other thought here strategically was, well, we've got seven years of pretty riveting footage and storytelling and great stuff. If you would just give us a chance, um, we could, and just, you know, this week we started negotiating with Spotify about giving us a dedicated space where we can host full length videos connected to the musicians in the project. And, and it seems like that's gonna go forward because I think they realize like they have the the canvas button, you know, on the on if you listen to you get a little six minute, but they're like, why are we just messing with six second things when Quibi and all these other folks are doing full episodes of things? Why don't we start actually branching into that space? And so we're trying to get on the front end of that because the journalism's already there and the music is already there, you know. So yeah, that's um pushing on an open door. Yeah. Um, I think that I'm, I'm torn right now because I want to keep this conversation going, but I think that we've got some questions coming in from the audience that actually are going to keep this conversation moving along. I think that Zoe brings up a, an interesting question, and I'll read it. It's like, Ian, what made you want to write this book in the first place? What got you started down this seemingly long, crazy path of sailing with pirates? <laughs> well, Zoe, um, uh, I was an anthropologist before I was a journalist and I was halfway through my dissertation and I was procrastinating in a cold Chicago winter and I ran away and got a job on a ship in Singapore to work as an anthropologist. And I was blown away by kind of the diaspora transient tribe that are seafarers, you know, these invisible people that have this home language and crimes and code of conduct and lifestyle that's unlike anything. So I became, fascinated by them. But then I had to go back to the real world and finish my doctorate. And then I got a job at the Times. So I had this actual um, embedded curiosity about the people. Um, I always was enamored with the space, but I didn't have much experience out there. But I, I knew there was this crazy, fascinating world. And so for four years straight, I pitched this idea at my editors at the Times. Send me to see, let's take our readers out to this you know, lawless frontier, 
And um, I guarantee you, I can bring back some incredible stories. And uh, finally, I got an editor that was willing to cut me loose. Really cool. No, it's like, and you talk a little bit about that. That's the way that you start off the book. Mm -hmm. um, and the struggle that you had to go through to get believed is like, hey, this is going to be a story. And then, oh my God, the can of worms that you opened up six years later, separated from your family and your friends, risking your lives. I, I just, I mean, the, the couple of the few times in the book where you talk about how you actually feared for your life is, uh, is, is pretty amazing. And the result, of course, is, you know, The Outlaw Ocean, a uh, credible book and a very, very, very deep read. But what the cool thing about it is that it's episodic. And so you, the commitment is a commitment to a chapter and you can read a chapter at a time and put it down and pick it up a week later or two weeks later. And you don't feel like you've actually, you, you're not lost, which is great because it's the kind of thing that can just live with you. And very, quite, very similarly to the way that you wrote it for the times, uh, people can read parts of the story and then start to, to really understand the full scope, which is, uh, just amazing. In the writing of the book, and you started thinking about uh, this music accompaniment, uh, a person asked, um, is there any specific story or vignette that you were like, oh my God, this would be amazing mm -hmm. as music? Yeah, so I love that question because uh, it allows me to give this answer, which is one of my favorite <laughs> answers. No. Um, so I actually used music as a mnemonic device for a long time. And I didn't realize how interesting it was until I pondered it. So often when I was witness to really intense situations and I wanted to capture the five senses and emotional reality of that moment as richly as I could, because I knew the next day there'd be a whole nother one and I would lose that first one. I would record notes, I would write notes, and I would also listen to music that, and I would seek out specific music that I thought most captured the feeling of that moment. And so there was one in particular where in the book, it's this clash that occurred between the in Indonesians and the Vietnamese, and we almost got lit up you know, by the Vietnamese, and it was really scary, and the Indonesians had to hightail out of there, and they, these military guys were really upset they lost a guy got taken hostage and they had to leave without him and there was a real like heavy heavy silence and weighty sense of loss of pride as we ran away uh, back to Indonesian waters and I remember sitting in the bridge just taking it all in and watching these guys and their embarrassment and I was trying to write it up you know um, so I could revisit the emotions and I captured several songs that I thought really got the gravity and edge and darkness of it. And so now jump to the music project. The notion of using music as a receptacle of emotion, uh, a mnemonic device, a Pavlovian, you know, almost device where when I listened to it again, I could more vividly recall that moment was something that when I started leaning into this music project, I thought that's totally relevant. You know, like that's actually respecting music for its true power. And to answer the question, that that scene in the book, um, that running away moment was one of the early moments where I was like, I've got to do something with this music thing because it's just really powerful. Yeah. Christopher, I mean, I mean, as an artist, do you do you write your music solely to express yourself or do you want to elicit emotions in the people who are listening to it are, are you i mean there's artists slash performer and i mean like there are musicians who are like i want to elicit this in the audience or the artist which is i'm going to express what i feel inside people are going to view this they can take whatever they want from it where are you what's kind of what camp are you in yeah that's a great question and i really feel that everyone's going to have their own experience of the music i'm not trying to control that at all and I can really only take responsibility of, of what I'm feeling and express that to the best of my abilities. And so there's always an, like an intention and an empathy for the listener, but I'm not taking responsibility of trying to please them or make them feel a certain way. I'm more interested in designing a space that people can enter into and then start to have their own experience within. I feel like that's 
really where something incredible and transformative starts to happen. You know, music, like so many art forms, it's it's a it's a co-creative process. No matter what I feel or whatever I'm trying to kind of control in the music or something, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of it, I'm surrendering that experience to the listener. And then the, ex the experience of that vibration coming into their ears and then going into their brain. And like Ian was saying, like triggering all these different memories, whether that's a, the experience and the smells of the light that may have happened when it first was experienced or something that it's evoking from their childhood or what our dream or whatever it may be, they're actually creating that music. So when someone listens to the unknown sea, which I've created through the inspiration of Ian's words, people are actually creating that experience within themselves, you know, and, and that's like this whole new, you know, ocean and, and kind of opportunity for transformation that's occurring. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not like always trying to express something I'm necessarily feeling or trying to have some type of like I within it. It's just that I'm in this body <laughs> and, yeah. and I have to, you know, it has to come out of me. And so I know what I feel and I can just let it come out, but I'm not trying to make anyone feel the way I'm feeling. But I mean, so what, kind of what you're describing is you're not only collaborating with, with Ian, but you're collaborating with the listener. For sure. And I've been to a number of your live performances and it is an experience. I think there's the, you can, you can get a sense of what the, the listener, how the listener is reacting, you know, whether the, the space is calm or there's an energy or there's a hum happening. So there's like a, a give and take. So you, you're, I mean, you're always collaborating. Yeah, we, all of us are, we are right now. Yeah. That's the beauty of it, you know, and, and coming back to the outlaw ocean, that's something that I, I don't think we fully comprehend that we we're all part of this thing. We're all on this earth. All of the choices we make are so significant. We're all collaborating together. We're all making this music together. It's called society, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful chemistry that we're all within. And as we can all more understand that fully in whatever way that makes sense, you know, it's, we're going to start to be able to have clear actions we can take together to get through all this. I think this brings, this is a great lead in to uh, the next question. Ian and Christopher, what other worlds or happenings on planet Earth would you love to hear scored with music? And I'd like to add to that. Ian, what stories would you like to tell? And Christopher, what, what sounds and stories would you like to bring to music that would bring awareness um, to people about things going on that they haven't experienced before. You want to go first, Chris? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I think I it's a huge answer. question. I would just say, I mean, there's everything, you know, and music truly is a universal language and it can speak to everything. I mean, my latest full album that came out was called Sunset. So, I mean, you're, you're speaking my language here for sure. <laughs> Um, and, so, and Sunset was created as a soundtrack for the sun setting. So, you know, you start at 20 minutes before the sun actually sets and then, yeah. you know, you have that experience with the music. So, but, you know, simply stated too, I can spend my, the rest of my life creating music that's connected to the ocean and different environmental causes. You know, it's just, there's, there's an endless abundance of inspiration that comes from this earth. And um, the more we can, you know, feel and experience and, and, you know, connect to these issues, you know, whether that's through music or through writing, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I would answer that. So the, the next most passionate thing um, that I've worked on in the past that I am now eager to loop back to was a piece I wrote for the magazine, for the New York Times Magazine, what, six years ago called The Secret Life of Passwords. And it's this strange, long piece about um, the hidden stories that many of us have um, in often one of our passwords. Um, it could be, you know, a password that we've designed because it's, you know, um, the song that 
was playing at our high school prom when she broke our heart or the date of our aunt when she got breast cancer or, you know, um, uh, an expression about how much you hate your boss or an inside joke with your best friend or it, like oftentimes we use things or the birthday of your son, you know, like we use highly, emo exactly what the tech guys tell us not to do. We use highly emotional, <laughs> personal things because they, they're memorable, right? Like they're very personal and we're never going to forget them. So we use those as keepsake passwords. So I wrote this, spent five years collecting these stories from people that were poignant and dark and funny and amazing and romantic and bizarre. And they all sprung from passwords. And so I wrote this piece called The Secret Life of Passwords. And it was really a weird piece, but it had all this pathos in it. And it kind of was another example of the, the weird thing that us humans do, we imbue inanimate things with meaning. And so I want to make, a, I want to expand that into a book and collect these crazy, interesting, weird stories that talk about our humanity, all unpacked from passwords. And that to me would be a perfect piece to like have music because it can go any direction, you know, like, and the musical interpretation of that anecdote can, you know, embody any of those emotional valences. So that, that would probably be the thing that I would next put music to. Um, it really taps into people's feelings. I think one of the things we're, we're not as aware of what be, is it's kind of cerebral beings is that we are guided by emotion, fear, happiness, um, wanting. And those are the ones that are actually some of the most, like they, they are the most memorable mm -hmm. things. Facts and figures disappear. And the way we felt um, or feel are things that actually are the most present uh, things that we sense, but don't always necessarily recognize them. I mean, Christopher, you get into that a lot in your music in terms of kind of tapping into how you feel and trying, I think I feel that you try to get people more connected with how they feel um, through your music. For sure. In a lot of ways, music is a very accessible form of meditation just surrender, listen, and, and the music does the work with you. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna jump into another question here. This is uh, the first instance I've heard of pairing music to a book. Chris, do you have aspirations to take this format and expand it, say scoring an entire novel chapter by chapter? I mean, you talk a lot about how you could write, write music about the ocean forever. Do you, I mean, sound, kind of doing a soundtrack I like the idea of doing a soundtrack to an entire book. Oh my gosh, I love this so much. I mean, I mean, I would love to make a piece for every chapter, you know, um, just of this book as well. And um, yeah, and, and future stuff that Ian is doing, you know, I, I just, I love it. I, absolutely, so inspired to keep keep playing with this. And, and I think there's a lot of uh, potential for like, you know, this, it, it's so unique that this is like investigative journalism. And, you know, I think with with uh, fiction, there's also a huge potential for artists and musicians to start working together, even in like kind of the early stages of something that's starting to, to build um, out of a out of a nebulous stage and, and how the music can start to create scenery and, and visuals within the story and, and things like this, too. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 in love with this. I think it's just a, another another angle of like creating music and how joyful and and wonderful that experience is. This is, this feels like a whole another kind of like tool within the creative process to start to explore more. Yeah, and I know that there. I know I've I've read some, and one of the uh, Natasha asks about the Netflix opportunity uh, that you're working on. I mean, and this kind of speaks to this idea that there's all these different mediums um, to tell the story. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Are you in a position that where you can actually dis discuss yeah, there's it? Yeah, no, there's nothing to see. I mean, so um, Netflix and Leo DiCaprio um, approached my publisher and optioned the movie and whatever other, you know, doc film and blah, 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 streaming rights for the book. And this was before the book was produced. So they purchased those rights, went out, produced the book. They own the rights. And the sort of tentative plan is to produce 
three streams of content from the reporting. One stream would be a doc series, um, which would have a team that would follow me. I'm, I'm continuing on this reporting for the next five to eight years. And so they would um, they've assembled a team and they're gonna follow me around on the subsequent trips. That would be a doc series for streaming. Then there's a feature film, which would be a fictionalized version of some rendering of the book. And they have a screenwriter for that. And then there's a scripted series, which is like Narcos on the Sea, you know, like, and you know, th these are big players and big names to drop. Whether any of this will come to fruition, I don't know. You know, it's all handled by my agent, but they own the rights and they're working on it and they've sent folks with me on various trips and the slow moving beast seems to be crawling forward. <laughs> um, I just try to focus on continuing to churn out stories and I would love to see something come out from them, but they for now own the rights to do that. And how it connects to the music is, you know, the dream here is that when they get far enough along, they'll think about scoring these products, right? And then they will turn to the people that we already have done the work for, right? And say, and I've talked with them and said, I'd, I'd like you to at least commit to looking at these artists first. You don't have to be obligated to use them, but please do consider the music project first. And they said, of course. So, but you know, again, it's such a huge company and how they make their own decisions. Amazing. I mean, I could, to, to look forward to something coming out of that uh, seems like such a great opportunity to binge watch. Oh my God. Yeah, it's well, incredible. We want, we, want to see, we want to see Leo play Ian. <laughs> no, we, don't. we really don't. We really don't. We don't want to see anyone play Ian. Ian should not be in the story. <laughs> I'm calling Leo and I'm, I'm making sure that that happens. <laughs> I'll never live that down amid my, amongst my peers nor my kids. <laughs> I've, I've asked them to please make sure there's no journalists anywhere in there. <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to say this is like, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, do, you either, do either of you have like some closing remarks that you want to make? I would throw out one thing, then Chris, you close up. Like the journalism is, is very difficult and very expensive. And the music business is extremely difficult and extremely expensive, <laughs> especially now. And so in some small way, if you want to support both of them, you know, listen to the music, listen to the song, you know, help get other people to put it on playlists, like help get it around because that's how you can support both of us in, in both of our crafts. And buy the book. Yeah, the sure. Do that too, but easier and easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, read the book and, and develop some calls to action for yourself. You know, there's a lot of simple things that we can do that are going to help heal our oceans. And Ian's taken a big first step here by shining a flashlight <laughs> on, the, on in, into the darkness. Um, so I'm super grateful to be part of this. And yeah, thanks everyone in Check 15 for hosting this. Really yeah, cool. thank, you. And thank you so much, guys. This, uh, this is better than I could have ever dreamed. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for, for joining us in Check 15. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for our next Conversations podcast coming soon. If you have a story that needs to be shared, we'd love to hear from you. For more information on Shack 15 and our community, you can email info at shack15.com, connect with us on Instagram, or visit our website at shack15.com.